verse 18, chapter 3 in Revelation. And the Bible says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. Amen. At this time, those that are able, if you'd like to kneel with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come today with so much appreciation and admiration. You're such a wonderful God. You've done so much for us, and we thank you for blessing Bible explorations that we can touch hearts around the world that, and give people hope that there is a, a, a new day coming, that things are going to change, and they're going to change rapidly. So just be with us, Lord. Give us strength and encouragement to continue to, to speak your word as, as you would have it spoken. And Lord, now we want to ask the healing for those that are in need, uh, Pat Allgood, and I'm sure several others. Uh, just continue to heal them, give them comfort, and, and uh, be with them. Lord, we want to ask a prayer for our speaker this morning, Brother John. May he bring us a word that we can understand and put in our hearts and that we can share the joy of your coming with others. And Lord, we just want to ask any shortcomings that we be forgiven, that, you know, train us, teach us, guide us. Uh, we just want to ask you to be with us in each step of our life. And your son Jesus that died for us, Yeshua, we say this prayer. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, well, some of the things we learned in part one of our series, that wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked, erring, and helpless are some of the things we can see by applying the ISAV from Christ who is to be invited in for that purpose. Spectacular displays of power from the Holy Spirit come when we become pure, and we saw why they won't until then. We saw spirit of prophecy quotations and whatnot. Uh, why we cannot pride ourselves in the things during the loud cry and why that's totally impractical. Uh, we're to know that all this power comes from God, not from us. And the people who are listening and see us do the things uh, we will be doing by the grace of God They'll be in, they will intentionally want to make us something we aren't. And we're going to have to realize <coughs> that we cannot open the eyes of the blind. We cannot unstop the ears. All the glory goes to Him. We're just people, and we cannot forget that. The importance of Bible study, and especially the presence of the indwelling Spirit, which is what the Laodicean message is partially about, he sometimes must pass by the wise and prudent to give his truth to babes. Christ said the Father will do that. 
I think we ha see that happening around us today. The Laodicean message is to accomplish two things. A close examine of the heart is one of those two. And then it is supposed to lead us directly into the giving of the loud cry. We saw that God is setting the world up to hear the loud cry. That he did that once before in 1888 and the people flunked. And we must not flunk. We must not happen, let that happen again. Those who are wavering and remain undecided, sitting on the fence to protect themselves, will eventually lose their crowns. Someone will take their place. We made that very clear, both in the spirit of prophecy, and we use a little scripture with it too. God will not be mocked. His truth will advance, even if he has to place my crown on somebody else to do it. The blind cannot lead the blind, and part of the message to lay to see is to the blind. Those who think they're working for God can be in reality working for the prince of darkness, and they better know the reasons and what shows the difference so it won't happen to us. We saw that to study ourselves approved is prime, but to have the indwelling of Christ is more prime. The first thing Laodicea has to do before they can have a loud cry or change and be something else other than Laodicea is to invite Christ in. That's number one. I stand at the door of knock. If any man, you know, hear my voice, let him come in, and I'll sup with him, and I'll bring my I salve, and you can apply it to your eyes so you can see what problems need to be taken care of and you can see how you're going to fit somewhat into that future program. And it ended with a question. I would like to know why you and I don't need to walk straight. Well, of course, we do need to walk straight. So that's just a quick synopsis of an hour lecture, and I want to move ahead. All right. Our testimony has to be seen, and our testimony has to be heard in order to be profitable to anybody else. Now, when it comes to walking straight, I want to make a reference to Elijah, because Elijah message is involved in it, isn't it? And he was walking straight and doing what God commands. So we're going to start right there. Think of Elijah. Does he weaken before the king? Remember he and the king met out in a, was kind of a desert place and the king was out to slay Elijah, tell everybody where Elijah was so they could get rid of him? Does he cringe and cower and resort to flattery in order to nullify the feelings of the engaged ruler? That's where the quote should end, by the way. Does he not know that the enraged ruler is otherwise the financial support of the prophets? Does he not know that the king can say, off with your head, and the head comes off? But Israel had perverted her way. The church was going the wrong direction. The whole church was going the wrong direction. Can you imagine such a thing as that? But Elijah would not forsake sacred and holy trust given to him. And we must not forsake the sacred and holy trust of the four angels' messages that have been given to us. Last time we saw the importance of faithful obedience to the message of the angels. Well, what about Elijah? <laughs> Shouldn't he sit back and watch for a while to say how things, see how things go before he makes his move? Does he prophesy smooth things to the king to obtain his favor? Will Elijah evade the issue, put it off for a better time? Will he conceal from the king the real reason why the country he's living in is having so many natural disasters and problems in wars? Will he pit everything off until things are stacked in his favor and the king has a better attitude? 
Aren't we tempted to do those things when a little crisis comes along? Should he open his mouth and let the word of God be heard? Should he speak the right thing at the right time? Should we speak the right word at the right time? When a little thing comes along, do we waffle a little bit? Eh, it's not all that important. When perhaps, perhaps you could put in a seed for the truth at that point in time that would develop by someone else at a later time. Do we take advantage of our opportunities? Are we so indecisive that we can't do that? Where are we? Is not the final Elijah message promised to those who are remembering the law of Moses? Why else would we be here if that wasn't true? Are we not to be driven out as Elijah was? Like some of the people of Africa are already and some of the people in the United States have been? Are we not to be protected by angels as Elijah was? And be translated as was he? Are we not standing on that same ground? In other words, if I really apply the message of Elijah to me, it says, stop goofing off. <laughs> profess what you believe and live according to what you profess. Do it now before you have to stand before kings and presidents and legislatures or whatever. Trust the holy book, the words of the prophets, and the spirit within. And the spirit will, ag will agree with the holy book and the prophets. It will all go together. The messages of the four angels represents our work. Your work, my work, our work. And little hints and opportunities and things and stands we make along the way, even under pressure, will help someone later on when the message comes stronger. We are the set-up people. When the power of the Holy Spirit falls upon His set-up people, they will have strength and power to carry the message like it has never been carried before. That's what Pentecost is all about. Trust is given to the final generation, meaning you and me. And we cannot betray our sacred trust. We cannot be willy-nilly about it. The final angel's message will lose none of its force as it goes toward the world. It will continue in strength and power until the whole world is lighted with His glory. Praise God for that. Did you know that our Messiah can take stones around this building and make witnesses out of them if He has to? Or He can take our crowns and give them to somebody else if He has to? Pray God that he doesn't have to. We don't want him to witness through stones. We're scheduled to play that part. You and I are scheduled to play that part. If the signs of the times are as we're reading and going on and things are happening both within the church and within the world as we have been seeing them, then you and I are scheduled to play a bigger part. Just when that happens, I can't tell you. But I do know we're in a testing time and in a preparing time, and that's what I'm concerned about this morning. And I think that's what the message of Laodicea is that will prepare us for the loud cry. Are we preparing for the soon coming great outpouring of the Spirit of God? Are we passing the tests He sends our eyes? Are we asking for the ISAF so we can see how to prepare and what we need to do to prepare? Are we seeing the message, our sins, the atonement for us, and the part we're to play? Is all this clear to us, or do we need Christ to come in all the way with His ISAF and clear it up for us? Oh, folks, when you pray for the Lord to come in and bring his ISAF, do it with an attitude of quivering lips. Not because the preacher gave a suggestion.
human agencies are called to do the work. You and I are those human agencies. Praise God. He's not calling for stones. He's calling for human agencies. What human agencies? If the major ministry is not employed in this work, then who will be? The Peters, the James, the Johns, the Keiths, the Rogers, the Marvins, the Chrises, the Abels, the Davids, the Kennys. They're the ones. And who are the deaconesses to hold them up and supply their needs and even bear witness themselves? The Marys, the Marthas, the Esthers, the Violets, the Vangies, the Nadines, the Sandys the Brigettas, the Teresas, that's who, all of us. She says, zeal and energy must be intensified. Talents that are rusting from inaction must be pressed into service. Wow. The voice that would say, wait, do not allow yourself to have burdens posed upon you. That's what Brother John, Elder John, is doing. He's giving you burdens on your shoulders that are hard to bear. <laughs> Wait, do not allow yourself to have burdens imposed on you is the voice of the cowardly spies. It's the cowardly spies that say, Wait, hold back. Don't go. <clears throat> we want Caleb's now who will press to the front. Chieftains in Israel who with a Courageous words will make a strong report in favor of immediate action. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Back at the turn of the century, they didn't get ready, get ready, get ready. They blew it. We're here to encourage one another, and this little group encourages one another as no group I've seen. Everyone has a love for the other one, and it's obvious. It just shows. The longer you hear, the more you see it. Praise God for that. Encourage your sisters. Encourage your youth. Encourage all to pass through this testing time, for that's where we are. We're in the testing time. And the devil will come with ideas and concepts and set you up for a fall, and the ISAB will help you see it and avoid it. Well, who went into the land of Canaan at last anyway? <laughs> Caleb and Joshua. <laughs> they were the ones. Caleb and Joshua. The men who said they go in, they, they could go in, went in. And later, because God was with them, they went into the land where all the rest had fallen dead in the wilderness. But you know the truth of it? J Joshua and Caleb had to wait 38 years along with them. Josh and Caleb were ready to go in, but they had to wait because of their brethren for another 38 years. Two out of ten. Does that sound like one in 20? No. Sounds like two out of a very small number. Wrong again. The millions of Israelites took sides with the ten that wouldn't go in. Well, I'm going to wait for the whole church to see this issue. When they make their move, I'm going to make it with them. <laughs> Anybody that did that died in the wilderness. They had to stand up for what they believed and believed what they were standing up for. They went with their perishing brothers as the Israelite wandered 38 years. But then how long have we wandered since 1888? At 116 or more years, of <laughs> the mercy and kindness of our Heavenly Father. Wow. But I'll tell you what, folk. I think there's about to be a crown shifting. What's going on in the world, what's going on in churches, what's going on in the main body church, it looks like there's going to have to be a crown switching if God is going to get his message out there. Somebody's got to do it. I tell you what, if we can't show our faith when opportunity affords, he'll have to find another people. 
But God promised faithful and, jo and Caleb, Caleb, Joshua and Caleb, that they would go in. And his promise is the same to Joshua and Caleb's today. Those who are faithful, those who will take up their work and use the opportunities, it may be offensive to self, but it may lay a seed for the salvation of someone else. It may cost me a problem. It may even cost me bucks. It may cost me prestige. I might not be so important as to other people as I once was. But God's message is more important than that, and the other guy is more important. That's what's called dying to self for Christ. The one you can witness to when you get an opportunity is more important than yourself. That's what comes from the heart of a person who has Christ in there guiding and teaching the way. Well, the wicked aren't going to wander for another 116 years, I'll tell you that. They're not going to wander another 38 years either. They may have stones in their hands, but they may only use them for about three and a half years in my thinking. And eventually they're going to drop their stones and fall dead. <laughs> not, not for 116 years or 40 years. They're going to fall dead for 1,000 years. They're going to have a long wait. And when they wake up, they won't go in with the Joshuas or the Caleb's. Even those who died way back in the Inquisition during the Dark Ages will march into the kingdom and their waiting will be over. You know, back, back in the early books of Revelation, about chapter 6 and 7, they're, they're still in their graves, those people who died for a witness during the Dark Ages. And, and in a sense, they're crying out, Lord, how long do I have to wait? How much longer? How much longer? And then the answer comes back, until your fellow servants are killed as you were. And then it leaves a suggestion that you can all march in together. Amen. When the selfish, ease-loving, panic-stricken people, fearing tall giants and walls, clamor for retreat, let the voices of Joshua and Caleb be heard, even though there are those who stand with stones in their hands ready to beat them down for their testimony. You see some of your church members with stones in their hands. They want to get rid of you. It'll come to that. A.T. Jones came along and he wrote these words. Now this brings us to the point where we are to stand faithful to the message of God and not be afraid of cowardly Seventh-day Adventists. I didn't say that. He did. This is where God wants us to stand. Firm. He wants us to know what the message is now. He wants us to give the message as it is now. And if there are those who would beat you down with stones and clubs in their hands and revile you or anything of the kind, thank God that now is the time for immediate action. What an attitude by A.T. Jones back at that time. Wow. Powerful, powerful, powerful. So let all the world around you know where you stand every opportunity you get. You don't have to make a big issue out of it. Just say, this is what I believe, and this is what I do, so this is, what I have to, this is where I have to go or be or say or whatever. <clears throat> let anyone who wants to know where you stand, let your wife or your husband know where you stand. Let your family know where you stand. Let your boss know where you stand. Let one another know where you stand. But mostly of all, let your Heavenly Father know where you stand. And then stand there. And that will take decisive action whenever you have opportunity. The opportunity may small, be small. The opportunity may be big. But don't let it go by. Don't betray sacred trust. Ellen White once wrote, It is when the unbelieving cast contempt upon the word of God that the faithful Caleb's are called. Oh, the word of God is no more anymore. The King James no good. Strong's no good. I believe these new, more intelligent versions. You know, blah, 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 blah. It is when the unbelieving cast contempt upon the word of God that the faithful Caleb's are called. It is then that they will stand firm at the post of duty without parade and without swerving because of reproach. Wow. 
the unbelieving spy stood ready to destroy Caleb. They all belong to the same church, folk. He saw the stones in the hands of those who had brought a false report. But this didn't deter him. He had a message to bear, and he would bear it. The same spirit will be manifest today by those who are true to God. See, they were getting ready to go into the kingdom back there. Ellen White talks about their insubordination. They have to be here for many, we may have to be here for many years. I don't know that she saw 116 years, but she said many years. The vast majority of the church joined with the ten spies. Don't forget that. Hope it doesn't happen again, but it certainly can. That's the precedent in the scripture anyway. They got its back up. They were ready to destroy both messengers and the message. They wouldn't have picked up stones if they didn't want to kill them. Ellen White says, I was confirmed in all that I had stated in Minneapolis that a reformation must go through the churches. Reforms must be made for spiritual weakness and blindness. Who's blind? Lay it is here. We're upon the people who had blessed with so great light and precious opportunities and privileges. We've been blessed with, blessed with great light, folk. As reformers, they had come out of the denominational churches, but they now act a part similar to that which the churches acted. They're going to treat the message just like the churches back then treated the Sabbath message. And that's exactly what's happening. Was she a prophet? Was she a prophet or not? We hope that there would not be the necessity for another coming out. What? What does that mean? We hope there would not be the necessity for another coming out. While we will endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace, we will not, with pen or voice, cease to protest against bigotry. Bigotry in the church is hard uh, aimed at the people who see something in the Scripture a little bit differently and the majority of the church can't handle that, and they become bigots against them. Ellen White said, I will not stop writing against that nonsense. So, should the non-believing men get nasty with us? According to her writings, that would preclude another coming out. That's what's happening in Africa. <clears throat> I'm sorry about that because the church is the one that's losing the opportunities. The section that says we hoped that there would not be the necessity of another coming out would be rather benign if the word hope didn't have a D on the end of it. It's like she hoped so but can't hope so anymore. Someday there will be another coming out. That's, that's what's indicated. Again, she wrote this same principle when she said, if we fail in our efforts to save these erring ones, and she's talking about the erring ones in the church, if we fail in our efforts to save these erring ones, we must come out from among them and be separate. Wow. You know, isn't that sort of what we've done? She's talking to SDAs about SDAs in this quote. Again, she wrote, that's not the one I want. If it be possible, said the Apostle Paul, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. But after quoting the Apostle's recommendation, Sister White added, there is a point beyond which it is impossible to, make, to maintain union and harmony without the sacrifice of principle. Separation then becomes an absolute duty. Woo! That's pretty strong. We hope it never comes to the duty of separation. We hope and trust we can live peaceably with all men. Amen? And yet we worship here because we're free to study and develop our talents and learn the things of the real issues of the end time so much more peaceably than we could in our old church Sabbath school classes. 
So it's kind of a natural result of things. We don't oppose them. We don't hate them. We don't fight them. We're not against them. It's just that we want to grow spiritually. We don't have time to ride in the boat for another 116 years. Good sense will dictate when that time would come. Those who remain involved too long with the erring flock are going to end up pretty severe circumstances. The warning here given is to what the disciples would have to meet at the hands of their fellow men as a warning to us also down here in the last days. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted, Christ said, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, uh, offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. These words will be fulfilled. This is not a conditional prophecy. There's a rough ride coming. If we can't win the little battles, how are we going to win the big ones? We need to allow the Lord to clear up our hearts and give us the stability to stand on the right and stand for the team with God. Another word or two from this same testimony. They must be hewed by prophets with reproof, warning, admonition, and advice. They must be hewed by who? Prophets. That they may be fashioned after the divine pattern. Isn't that what we want? We want to be fashioned after the divine pattern. So where do we go? We look for the prophets. What do they believe? What do they teach? The Torah. You can't find one that didn't, because if he didn't teach it according to the Torah, he wouldn't be in the Old Testament. They would have removed him a long time ago. They must be hewn by the leaders in the churches. Is that what it says? Come on now. With what did the prophets do their hewing again? The Torah. Did Christ said, say he's coming to do away with the Torah? I don't think so. He did not come to do away with the Torah or the prophets who taught it. Neither one. All right. A little different caution. And you must see this too. The world is not to be our criterion. Let the Lord work. Let the Lord's voice be heard. If there's something in the world that disagrees with what you ought to be doing and what you'd rather be doing because you're drawn by Christ to do it, then you'll have to stop listening to all the reasons why the world gives you not to move ahead. The world is not our criterion. Let the Lord work. Let the Lord's voice be heard. Those employed in any department of the work whereby the world may be transformed must not enter into alliance with those who know not the truth. That says, be not involved in the ecumenical movement. Could it be any clearer than that? Do you know of any church that's being more and more involved with the ecumenical movement? I think you've seen enough quotes and headlines and things from here in the past and I'm not trying to be critical against the church. I'm just start, trying to warn my brothers and sisters to, to, to apply the ISAB and see what the other possibilities are or some of these other problems are or what we may have to face. But what you really need to do is be on your knees on your own talking to God personally in prayer and seriously inviting them in and say, take your time, Lord, but use the ISAB. Don't bowl me over to where I can't handle it, but show me where the wrong things are that I might, by your grace, make them right and show me where I fit into the end time events. That's the Laodicean message. The world knew not the Father or the Son. Well, I could preach a sermon on that now, but I won't. <laughs> you know where that's heading. And they have no spiritual discernment as to the character of our work, as to what we shall do or shall not do. We must not obey, we must obey the orders that come 
from he from above. Where are the four angels? Below, with us, or above? The above. We are not to hear the counsel or follow the plan suggested by unbelievers. Suggested made by these who know not the work of God is doing it for is doing for this time will be such as to weaken the power of the instrumentalities of God. You are the instrumentalities here. By accepting such suggestions, the counsel of Christ is set at naught. So we can't go to disobedient organizations for counsel. Well, that's rough. A lot of churches doing that. Friends, if there's no danger, God would have not told us that there is. What is that warning? Is there any danger that the church might be following the other churches today? Well, I would hope not. He told us long ago that some of the organizations might have things that were good. Temperance, he mentioned, is one of them. But as long as they're allied to the mark of the beast and eventually the laws to compel people and to force the conscience, we cannot join with them, period. We can be friendly, but we can't join with them. We can try to help them, but we can't join with them. We are an independent group in subjection of the Almighty, the throne of God, the Heavenly Father, who has adorned the four, uh, uh, the four angels with a special message for us. The Lord wants us, our group, and groups like us around the world to be totally His, totally dedicated. Shall he have us? Can he use us? Shall we be fully submissive to his will? Not my will, his will. How long can we hold out? Another 116 years? No, 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 no. We must come fully into harmony with God on every issue, even the small ones. We're to listen to orders from above and obey those orders. There's a world on this point. Oh, man, let me read more. I just got to. Listen to this. It's so beautiful. All seem to have a deep sense of their unworthiness and manifested entire submission to the will of God. This was a group of people that Ellen White saw moving ahead, doing what's right. That's where we've got to be. That's what we have to be. Of whom does she speak this? To the faithful in 1844? To the faithful in 1888? She might well have. No, she's speaking to our generation. Look at the context. Great power was with those... I'm sorry. Great power with these chosen ones, said the angel. Look ye, my attention was turned to the wicked or unbelievers. Unbelievers are wicked, wicked are unbelievers. Who does the Bible describe as the wicked? Psalms 119, 155. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not what? Who's the wicked? They seek not what? Don't be confused. Know where the enemy message is. And stand up in a nice way for what's right every opportunity you get. Try not to be offensive. But if they push you, you might have to be. Notice this. They were all astir. The zeal and power of the people of God had aroused and enraged them. Confusion, confusion was on every side. I saw measures taken against this company who had the power and the light of God. Measures will be taken against us. Darkness thickened around them, yet they stood approved of God, trusting in Him, and I saw them perplexed. Next, I heard them praying unto God earnestly. Through the day and night their cry increased. <clears throat> I heard these words, Thy will, O God, be done. If it can glorify Thy name, make a way of escape for Thy people. 
all seem to have a deep sense of their unworthiness manifested entire submission to the will of God. That's where we've got to be. But there'd be no escape for a while. No escape. Soon after they had commenced their earnest cry, the angels in sympathy would have gone to their deliverance. But a tall commanding angel suffered them not, said he, the will of God is not yet fulfilled. They must drink of the cup. They must be baptized with the baptism. Satan will have his last big warfare to wipe God's people off this planet. That's you. That's you. Wow. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Now, what is she talking about here? She gives this warning to us. Didn't she know the church was going through no matter what? I'm sure his church is going through no matter what. But there's a little bit of confusion what the church might be today. He who wept over impenitent Israel, noting their ignorance of God and of Christ, their Redeemer, looked upon the heart of the work at where? Battle Creek. That's where the general conference was. That's where the head of the church, that's where the head of the, organ of the organization was. And she's saying in that context, their candlestick can be what? Removed. Great peril was about the people. Some knew it not. Unbelief and impenitence blinded their eyes, Laodicea, and they trusted to human wisdom, the PhDs, in the guidance of the most important interests of the cause of God. Does it not trust today to the TPHDs, the traditions, and the pride, and all the rest of it? Will they honestly look at the fourth angel's message? Oh, I pray they would. The angel commissioned to bring much more from the law of God. Are they going to look at that, scratch their heads, and say, well, where are we going to find a lot more from the law of God than the Ten Commandments? Will they look honestly at it? I wonder. I hope so. The original apostasy began in a disbelief and denial of the truth. The truth was presented, but they denied it. That's where the apostasy began. Now, this tells us there was a lot of apostasy in the church at that time. What does the word original imply? Yeah, there's going to be another one. That's right. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be talking about the original if there's not another one down the line someplace. She continues, When the days come, and they surely will, in which the law of God is made void, the zeal of the true and loyal should rise with the emergency and should be more warm and decided in their testimony, should be more positive and unflinching. If we're not positive and unflinching now, how in the world will we be positive and unflinching then? See, I'm not, I'm not saying we're supposed to stand up and be bigots about what we believe. I'm saying we're supposed to be honest, decided, non-wavering, and able to give a witness without a tongue-in-cheek. We should notice that they're already true and loyal before the emergency comes. Read about Laodicea. Read the references in the spirit of prophecy. Honestly ask for the eye side. I said, all right, here we go. There are some who have prided themselves on their great caution in receiving new light. Oh, I'm just smarter than the rest of all those people in there. Uh, um, but uh, I'm going to be a little more cautious about this thing. Evidence has been shown week after week, night after night. DVD, DVDs are out ever and everything. But I'm going to wait and be more cautious in receiving new light. But they are blinded by their enemy and cannot deserve the works, discern the works and the ways of God. Light, precious light, comes from heaven. Yeah, four angels worth. And they array themselves uh, against it. So what's next? 
These very ones will accept messages that God has not sent and thus will become even dangerous to the cause of God because they set up false standards. Oh, it makes sense, all right. Yeah, I can see where you're going, all right. But, but I want to be a little more cautious about this. Ellen White doesn't look at that with very good comment. They need, again, they need the heavenly anointing that they may comprehend what is light and truth. May not change a single heart until we bow down before God, invite Christ in, and even honestly ask for the ISAF. The warning also applies to me, to me especially. I especially need the heavenly anointing in order to complement uh, uh, God's Word and to understand what He's trying to say to me. I don't want to re repeat something that I hear from Him and read from Him that's not true or right. I need the ISAP all the time, especially when I'm studying for the messages. In the manifestation of that power which lightens the earth with its glory, they shall see only something which in their blindness they think dangerous. See, I don't want to be with that group. Something which will arouse their fears and they will brace themselves to resist it. That final message, this will be the result to most people. They'll brace themselves to resist it. Is that what we see today? She's an honest prophet. She's direct. She's telling the truth. Laodicea is blind. And if she doesn't use the eye salve, she'll never see it. So stand tall. Don't give a partial picture to eliminate your own embarrassment. Don't hold back on the truth for the sake of the one you're talking to. <laughs> that very one needs it as much as you do. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've got five minutes left, and I've got two-thirds preached. What do you think? Well, you've heard a lot already, haven't you? Do you feel challenged? I want you to feel it's worth it being here. Many of you have traveled many, many miles. I don't mean to challenge you to put you down. I, need to, I mean to challenge you to show you your opportunities. And God is directly looking for a people today that He can count on. What I'm trying to do is encourage you to be one of those people. And I do that at the risk, I know, of having some people, well, that's not for me, goodbye, I won't see you anymore. I realize that. But that's not my concern. Oh, I love them, sure, but my concern is that everyone can see the truth to the church of the Laodicean and its message and become more like the Philadelphian to receive Christ when he comes. That's what I want. So I pray that will work with you. Maybe after potluck, if someone likes to stay a little later, we could look at the rest of it. I'll let you decide that. But let's have, uh, have a short word of prayer, and, and I'll step aside. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for being kind to these people, these dear, wonderful, precious souls that are sitting before me this day. I pray, Lord, that you will anoint our eyes with eyes. Have. Help us to see the problems we have and not to be willy-nilly or wishy-washy because of this reason or that reason and, and use our human abilities to justify this and that. Help us to be positive witnesses, pure and true, simple and honest and sweet in our attitude, but non-yielding, we ask in thy name. Amen.